historians have typically called Korea the Forgotten War, and I, I would articulate that Afghanistan is now the new Forgotten War. We are coming after a viable threat in a um, very, very unstable and strategically important area. It was right to go into Afghanistan. Even though it's been difficult for the country, I have no question at all that this was reasonable and correct conflict to fight. Like Iraq in Afghanistan, we found that it was, it was this, you know, when you got down to this, the smaller the unit, when those units were out there operating amongst the population, you could get a real sense for what the people that they were working with really needed. One of the, my biggest jobs as a platoon leader was to be able to keep my guys motivated and to be able to, you know, to let them know the progress that we were making, to let them, to validate their efforts. There's problems of massive corruption of the Afghan government. These have to be addressed. Why should we care about Afghanistan? My response to that question would be, why should we care about any peoples in any country? Ultimately, late 1970s, a communist regime came to power that very soon ran into trouble and essentially asked the Soviet Union for assistance. The Soviet Union provided some assistance until in 1979 they actually sent in military personnel and ultimately invaded the country. In the early 1980s we started a covert program that later became more or less overt. Out of that time period came a lot of the different warlords that frankly you still see wielding a lot of power in Afghanistan today. The warlords that had been our allies fought each other in spectacularly violent and horrible fashion. So massacres in the streets of Kabul and around Afghanistan, rapes, pillaging, the atrocities are just unimaginable. The Taliban, which really emerged from the south of the country and slowly worked their way up, everywhere they conquered, they provided law and order. And they didn't rape, and they didn't pillage, and they didn't violently kill people in the streets, initially. And so that's why they were able to come to power. This is perhaps the most horrific sight anyone could have witnessed uh, in a lifetime. Absolute, incomprehensible mayhem. A lot of people were breaking down and crying. It was that Al-Qaeda presence in Afghanistan that enabled the attack upon the United States of America. No. That we've just had another explosion. The Afghan government at the time was sheltering Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, which planned those attacks on U.S. soil. They were asked whether they would give up Al-Qaeda, and they said no. In order to have a secure Afghanistan, uh, we must have a secure Pakistan. And, and what I'm talking about directly are the uh, insurgent safe havens in, uh, in, in, in Pakistan and the tribal areas. The Taliban until today has enjoyed sanctuary inside of Pakistan. They may be, they, the Pakistani leaders, may be rethinking now whether or not a Taliban victory in Afghanistan would be in their national interest. And there's increasing evidence that they would regard a Afghan Taliban victory as not in their interest. That that could then uh, an Afghan Taliban led Afghanistan or an Afghan Taliban that controlled parts of Afghanistan would ally themselves with the Pakistan Taliban and that would work then against Pakistan's security interest. There's also been allegations of um, rogue elements of the ISI being involved in insurgency. So I think those, those are the questions that we have to be able to resolve. And I think we can only do that through uh, engagement, active engagement with Pakistan. Until Pakistan unequivocally then reaches the conclusion that all international terrorists, all extremist militant groups are enemies of their state, then I believe that our interest and Pakistan's security interest are simply not going to be aligned. I think a lot of times in Afghanistan it, it's very difficult to see progress. What I did notice was that the more time that I spent with specific village elders, with specific towns, the more they got to see me and I got to see them, 
the more progress I felt like I was making. You know, when you got down to this, the smaller the unit, when those units were out there operating amongst the population, you could get a real sense for what the people that they were working with really needed, and, and it, it was the smaller projects actually that, that seemed to have the, the greatest impact. We'd sit down and we'd talk, and we'd talk about a lot of different things. There were things that I was trying to figure out in terms of what their issues were, um, how how they're interfacing with the government. To enlarge the shop. The thing about counter-surgery, it's not how well you do during your one-year tour, it's, it's how well you can build capacity uh, amongst the Afghans and, and how well you can leave something that's, that's enduring. I think President Karzai's uh, legacy uh, in history as the first president of Afghanistan will in large part be measured about how he performs on two critical tasks. One is how effective uh, he'll be viewed as setting up the machinery and the systems of executive government. Secondly, will be how accountable his government is regarded at the point of transition and beyond. Much more has to be done, especially on the question of accountability. There's problems of massive corruption of the Afghan government. These have to be addressed. What I can say is from my own experience, I mean, one of the major pieces of Afghanistan being able to survive as a functioning country is their ability to provide security for their people. And where does that mainly hinge on? That's the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. I think it has to be a balanced entity that remains in, uh, in Afghanistan. First of all are the uh, trainers who are vitally important to uh, be able to continue to advise and assist the Afghan combat formation. It's going to take, I think, a continued military presence, not just reliance on the Afghan military forces. So that's definitely that counterterrorism mission that I know the United States and others want to remain engaged in after 2014, to make sure that al-Qaeda cannot strategically re-emerge and conduct such horrific, catastrophic attacks upon Western targets. U.S. military action, we believe in Pakistan, has resulted in the death of Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden is dead. Al-Qaeda is under tremendous pressure in Afghanistan, in uh, Pakistan, and that pressure has been exerted by and large by intelligence and military bases found inside of Afghanistan. I probably wouldn't phrase it as whether or not we're a better nation for it. I think it was absolutely worth it to fight this war. And I know that's difficult to say because a lot of American soldiers have lost their lives and we have expended a lot of financial resources. But when you look at this from the 9-11 perspective, not the 2012 perspective, I think it was absolutely right to go in and do this. And I just hope that we can be committed enough in the long run. Over the last 10 years, with a lot of help from the international community and the United States of America, the, Afghan, uh, the Afghans have had some pretty impressive results in terms of establishment of a political framework for a new democracy that uh, is sustainable. Afghan army and police on the security front have had some uh, very important uh, gains. What's interesting is that no one has yet made public commitments about how much economic aid will go to Afghanistan going forward. In a way, unfortunately, with the big military effort, the economic and social piece of this has always been a bit of an afterthought. I think there's the outline of an economic system which should provide the basis for uh, increasing material wealth for the Afghans over many, many years. There is economic activity. The image that you sometimes get of Afghanistan in the West as solely a narco state is not entirely true. Our aid money has built a lot of roads. We're starting to build rail links to the rest of Central Asia. Afghanistan has a huge number of mineral resources, which if they are stewarded appropriately, could frankly make the state solvent. Early on in the years after the Taliban fell, the U.S. government supported the installation of the American University of Afghanistan. In about 2007, uh, 
two students walked into my office and they, they said, could we build a, a law program at American University of Afghanistan? We launched a program, the Afghanistan Legal Education Project, and it's been going for over five years now, where we are uh, offering 10 law courses. My students have written six law books critically analyzing the laws of Afghanistan, and those books are used in class. We hire the faculty. And the magic of this project is that my students are in incredibly inspired at Stanford to write these textbooks. They do a fantastic job. They've got world-class research and writing skills. Then we go to Afghanistan. We see our, our books in action uh, being taught by well-qualified faculty and students who really want to learn. Afghans have gotten used to a different way of life. Kabul is an incredibly different city from what it was 10 years ago. It's, it, it's got a sense of urbanity in, in, in the Afghan context. Girls are going to school, two million girls across Afghanistan are going to school now, which is an incredible achievement. The question that, that I ask that will be answered in the coming years is whether Afghans, having become used to a different way of life after the fall of the Taliban, are willing to fight for that way of life. One can almost foresee a, a brighter future for the country. There's a very small subset of people that are starting to bear the cost for America's wars. Fight! This is this is not upper middle class America. These are people who are very hard working blue collar Americans. And more and more, especially coming from the military, you get the sense that that's really the piece of America that's bearing the cost for this, bearing the brunt of this. They've done a lot of things to help the people help themselves. And quite frankly, the next step needs to be the Afghan people taking ownership of that opportunity that for the last almost 12 years we've we provided. It's very easy to just, I mean, you, to go about your business every day here and not think about there's guys right now in Afghanistan who are fighting for something that they believe in, for something that they believe this country believes in. It is, it's a little concerning to me that um, how easy it is for people to put it out of their mind. Hey, they're still there. Business got eyes on. Wait, hey, give me a distance to rest. Get inside, yeah. Go, 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 go. Yo, man, let me have a water fight.